daily meditations called Forward Day by Day. And our mission is to inspire disciples and to empower evangelists. And that's our Spanish website, benadelante.org, which literally means come forward. <clears throat> The Lord be with you. God, Father, a mother who told the disciples where to cast the nets, lead us by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit to cast our nets in the right place at the right time with authenticity and with passion, so that we too may become fishers of people. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. So, um, you're going to ask someone to. By the way, this is a PowerPoint presentation that I already gave to Sarah, so it's going to be with all the other ones. You don't need to take notes, perhaps. I need notes. I would prefer if, if, if you look at me. Yeah. <laughs> so, being down there. You said, do you think you can read that? He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let your nets down for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let nets let down the nets. So Jesus instructs them to cast the nets. Um, he tells them where and when. Does anyone know the end of the story? Do you know the end of the story? Lots of fish. Lots of fish. So many and fish, it broke the net. It almost broke the net. I don't know if it broke it, it almost, it almost broke it, which is even nicer, right? Um, so, let me tell you something about Spanish. To cast nets in Spanish is echar las redes. And if you want to say to cast networks, it's also echar las redes. The word nets and networks is the same, red, which I thought is a wonderful, a wonderful um, inspiration for what, for having this um, uh, being commissioned by Jesus in the face, you know, to go and cast those nets and those networks. This paper has three parts, uh, but it's going to be pretty fast. First, I'm going to give you some stats. First, let me tell you that um, for this. Uh, stats I'm using Wikipedia, okay? Um, there's a difference between, uh, well, everyone uses their own system for statistical information. Um, later I'm gonna show things from the, the Pew Research Center. And the Pew Research Richard Center only considers Latino someone who is 18 or older and will answer, yes, I am Latino or Latino. Um, I think this, so the numbers are different. The numbers are lower. The amount of Latinos significantly lower. I think here it tries to capture um, also those who are under 18. Uh, so we're talking about 52 million people or over 16% of the population, 47 of whom are American citizens. So that would mean that only maybe 5 million are either Permanent resident, um, permanent residents, mm -hmm. uh, people who came here as students, people who perhaps came and overstayed their visa, so they came legally, but now they have a more iffy legal status, and people who crossed without paying. So all of them are just a tiny number compared to the whole amount of Latinos. <clears throat> I love the Pew Research Center. I don't know if you guys are familiar, but almost any research you can do. And over there, Hispanics, <laughs> you have a special uh, um, tab just for, for Hispanics. Wonderful, wonderful research. Now they are doing wonderful things about uh, Trump and, and Twitter and things like that. <laughs> um, this is one of their best papers for my purposes, but I'm not, I'm not going to talk about it. I just wanted to mention it. It's called The Shifting Religious Identity of Latinos in the United States. So one in four are former Catholics. Isn't that 
interesting for us. Uh, this is from 2014. This is the one that I'm going to talk about. It's called Digital Divide Narrows for Latinos as more Spanish speakers and immigrants go online. So here you have uh, how much the gap has reduced um, between Hispanic and white people. In fact, and these are the percentage of folks who say that they use the internet. In fact, we have more Hispanics than Blacks at this point, saying that they use the internet. Um, the definition of Latino or Hispanic is complex, but let's just say that for these purposes, or for these definitions, um, they can be of any race. So when we say Latinos, um, when we say Blacks, when here it says Blacks, it is non-Latino Blacks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and here we have the ones who are foreign born versus US born, maybe um, 91 percent uh, or US born, 78 for foreign born, for people who are English dominant, for bilinguals, and for people who are Spanish dominant. Those are the percentages. Pretty impressive. Yeah. Here you can see some of the breakdown in categories of um, percentage of Latinos who say that they use the internet. And here it's not surprising what you see. You see mostly they are male, mostly they are young, right? And mostly they are US born. But in some of the stats, the differences are not, are not that big. One thing that I knew already before seeing is this stats is that many first generation folks use, um, take advantage of this technology to communicate with people, you know, when their family is outside the US. So it's very crucial for many of them to, to have the technology available. Can I ask you, Google? Yes. Yeah. Just your guess, not few numbers unless you know them. When What's your guess? It says here, so 94% of English dominant language reference self identified Latinos use the internet. What's your guess about what percentage of that 94 do not speak Spanish? Right? Because yeah. that's the other second, third generation challenge. Is, I mean, I'm just guessing from your, just your experience. From my Probably. A minority, um, because it's changing every day. I mean, yes, and you have, you know, you have Latinos established, you know, throughout the southwest of this country who have been there for, for centuries, and some of them, you know, I grew up in Argentina, and my last name is Basque, and I grew up with a sense that I was Basque. Now I only have Basque, right? Because my mom, my mom's ancestor, and my dad. Only, you know, he, his father is Basque. So, but that identity of him Basque, so if people would ask me, I would say, yes, I'm Basque, you know? And when I moved to the US, for the first time, I was asked if I was Latino. And I said, no, I'm not Latino. <laughs> we don't, we don't, we, in Argentina, we don't grow up with that identity, right? But so long as people claim their, their identity for some reason, they are proud of their, uh, you know, Hispanic heritage, they are proud of Last name, perhaps, or they are proud of some tradition, things how to cook a meal, may have nothing to do with the language. Mm -hmm. Hugo, could I just make a comment about that? Yeah. Um, I think, too, um, that you have in those numbers a large professional community in professions where business predominantly is conducted by him. Oh, absolutely. And it could be because it, when you know we have, was doing all this child welfare work, we had um, we did enormous focus group studies with uh, Hispanic social workers and people that did that work around the country. And for years, we had entirely separate websites. We had an English website, we had a Spanish website. And after we did all this focus group work, we found out that the professional community, which was a huge community, huge, 
prefer to do their work in English. But if they were doing work with families, they wanted it in Spanish. Or they wanted things to use with their families that were in Spanish. Yeah. Which was, I think you see, uh, you know, we, we did some of this work a few years ago. And I think you see, though, reflected in those numbers that it's regarding internet use and online channels, a, the large group of uh, practitioners, if you will, mm -hmm. um, reflected there. And I think that's going to change mm -hmm. rapidly. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. It's anecdotal, but. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. No, just thank you. Yeah. Um, this is about broadband. There hasn't been, in comparing 2010 to 2015, little progress there, whites and blacks a little more mm -hmm. progress in those five years. And is this an economic constraint or? Well, well we could argue that there are economic <laughs> reasons why, but something coming up that will also okay. enlighten this. <clears throat> Mobile internet, mm -hmm. okay? Um, see how many, you know, there's a large percentage of Latinos using mobile internet. This is important for us to know, you know, what kind of content do you want to reach Latino? Is it going to be mobile? It's a completely different uh, environment, right? When you see the little screen that you are in front of a larger screen. So this is information that can be useful for us as we think how to reach Latino folks. And this one is the mobile internet use comparing Hispanics, white and black, and see how high the number is, even higher than whites. Uh, no, not higher than whites, but yeah, I'm white. Let's see. Yes, yes, yeah, much higher white. <coughs> as much as black. Do you guys know? Do you guys know why? I know partly why. Why? I worked for some of these technology companies years ago. Years ago, the technology companies invested in mobile infrastructure mm -hmm. in international mm -hmm. profoundly more at larger and larger um, investment rates than in hardwire cable. And so you have these generations internationally of people who were more accustomed to using mobile devices. They didn't have landline phones. Yes. But it's much, right. I used to tell communications manager, mobile is much more flexible and resilient and it's much cheaper. It's cheaper. Right. Let me show you the last one and the whole picture. I think we'll see the whole picture. Only 10% of white smartphone owners are considered smartphone. So this is a concept of smartphone dependent Latinos. So only 10% of white owners. What does that mean? It means that they have an other device. They have broadband at home, they have other computers. Hispanics and black smartphone owners, however, are twice as likely to be Smartphone dependent, they, the only access to the internet that they have is with their smartphone. 23% of Hispanics and 90% of black families. This is a real constraint in schools if you're expected to be able to get online to do your homework, or check your grades, you know, if you have to pay for data. It's yes, constraint. yes. When I lived in North Carolina, my husband was a PhD student there. We lived poorly in a poor neighborhood. And there was a nonprofit that uh, was providing free of charge internet to the whole apartment complex. I thought it was awesome. You know, you have, there are nonprofits doing that. Yeah. <laughs> that was, you know, the right information. That's awesome. We've been talking about churches. You should do that. Mm -hmm. That's right. right. Yeah. yeah. We should all be yeah, here that comes. Yeah. Right. So, um, Okay, I'm not going to talk about this, but I wanted to talk about young Latinos mm -hmm. because that's another important thing that you have to understand. Young Latinos and Latino millennials, our friend Afshan Guillen, who is a missioner for Latino Ministries and Presentation, that he loves to give about millennial Latino folks. And they are young, they are bilingual, they are perfectly fine in English, but still they are Latino. Mm -hmm. And if we are smart, we are going to use that one way or another. They don't need 
translation in this language. They don't need you to address it in Spanish. But still, there's something, there's something about my abuelita, perhaps, right? Mm -hmm. You know that word abuelita. Mm -hmm. So they would be speaking in English, but the word abuelita is there in Spanish. Mm -hmm. okay. Very important the Hispanic institution, the abuelitas. <laughs> <clears throat> Part two, issues you need to know. I'm going to, I'm giving a very brief overview of things, maybe like putting together, like a casserole, and putting together this <laughs> The diversity of the Latino Hispanic population, right? They can be the black, the, they, the race can be like black, you know, or look black, you know, they, they can look very, you know, very white, you know, very pigment, uh, pigment depraved. Uh, uh, perhaps this is yeah, more traditional when we think of a Latino person or Hispanic person, but they become no race. So it's more of a cultural concept. Think about all these variables that we have in Latino people race and ethnicity, cultural diversity, meaning that you know, it's not just Latino culture, but specific country, right? We have different culture, socioeconomics, country of origin. Uh, first versus second versus third generation. The, I will not define here generations. It gets very complicated very soon. Mm -hmm. But you can go and research it. Uh, language, the language they speak. Um, I was, um, we, we attended for a while a multicultural church in Cincinnati, in downtown Cincinnati, um, called Church of Our Savior. And sometimes I would hear these ladies speaking none. They came from Guatemala, mm -hmm. and their native language is Spanish. It's an indigenous language that has absolutely nothing to do with Spanish. And Spanish was their second language. Um, well, with the first generation, we have the issue of legal status, which can be, I already mentioned, it can be many different things. Um, the religious backgrounds, right? The stereotype that they are all Catholic, you know? Of course, it would be grace, uh, you know, when you begin, trying to target Latinos to consider that probably yes, you know, many of them do come from a Roman Catholic background, but not all of them necessarily, right? <clears throat> I grew up in Argentina in a Mormon family. So I know the Bible a lot better than your average Catholic person. Right? Um, sexual orientation, gender identity, you know, we tend to believe that there's, uh, you know, the, these Latin American countries are very <coughs> machistas and very homophobic, which traditionally is true, but now not anymore, you know. And you have LGBTQ groups in every, in every country in Latin America, you know, some of them now uh, have uh, established uh, same, you know, same marriage equality, as we call it, and, um, and many of them come out, you know. LGBT, <coughs> and then the whole issue of, of, of the use of these terms, right? Latino, Latina. Latino would be the masculine, those of you who studied Spanish or, or, or Latin know this. Latina would be the feminine ending, so the woman would be a Latina woman. We use this, I love the, the ad sign, and I use it all the time when I write uh, things on the internet. Web pages, Facebook. I love to use this. How do you say it? You ever... No, you, you you have to choose. <laughs> when you say it, you have to choose Latino or Latina, but the idea is that you have the O and the A together, right? And many scholars, particularly queer theory scholars, came, came up with this term Latinx, and and this is really this is quite controversial. Yeah. But what you are doing, if you use this term, first of all, well, you're going to use it in Spanish because it doesn't exist in Spanish. You're going to pronounce. It. But the second thing is that really what you're doing is you are you are making a statement about the, the fact that you don't believe in the male-female binary. You say, I'm moving beyond the male and female binary. It's no longer a binary. It could be something in the middle or something without gender identity. <laughs> so this is an example of a church. This is in Renton, Washington, very close to Seattle. The church of um, a friend of mine. He's originally from Mexico. I believe he has bilingual services. 
meaning that he uses both Spanish and English in his services, together, it's together. But the name of the church, the main name, the name that appeared on the Facebook page is Our Lady of Guadalupe, it's in English. I think very smartly he's targeting second generation, third generation Latino folks. These are folks whose primary language and perhaps only language is Spanish, is English. But maybe they had an abuelita who was devoted, you know, she, she was really devoted to the Virgin of Guadalupe. Okay? And just things as, as simple as that, I think, have a power to connect us with um, folks who will join me. Um, the Jesus movement in our Episcopal branch. <clears throat> so, where do Latinos hang out online? Well, the short answer is that everywhere, you know, where the other Latinos, but you will find differences. I hear that many Latino folks who have connections with Latin America use an app which is called WhatsApp. WhatsApp. I don't use it, I, I don't need it for anything, but that might be a way, you know, if you're interested in reaching some of these people, you might be thinking about you know, that. For Latino Episcopalians, really there's one place, and that place is the Facebook group, Latino Hispanic Ministries of the Episcopal Church. We have almost 4,500 members, so it's very, very large. And I'm one of the administrators of this group. Um, which is great because I don't have any duties that I have to do on a regular basis. But I kind of keep an eye on things and I love to follow what was going on. Of course, very few posts, right? Of those over 4,000, it's a bunch of us who are posting all the time. Um, and uh, very, very recently, Juan Oliver, who is a retired priest living in New Mexico, and bilingual and very involved in Latino ministry, asked the question, I would like to know, you know, uh, what country are you from? And these are the results. Of course, this is just the ones who decided to respond. Uh, but it was interesting to find out that 34 were coming from the US, 17 from Mexico, about 12 from Puerto Rico, about six from the Dominican Republic, Etc. Etc. It was interesting to have uh, those numbers, um, and it's interesting that we have many folks there who are really not part of the Episcopal Church. They are part of the Anglican Communion. They could be in Mexico. They could be in other parts of the Southern Cross. Okay, this is an example of something that we did, and this this was really really awesome. Um, you will recognize uh, some folks here, as Jeremy, Kyle, and me, <laughs> are there. And then again, is here, she's a mission for the moment. So, uh, because of um, a resolution that was passed um, two and a half years ago at General Convention, uh, for the first time, uh, Anthony Guillen had, was given a few funds, very, you know, very carefully. Uh, the resolutions were very explicit about what he had to use the money for. But one thing was about creating networks, of, you know, in the Latino church and in province nine. And we went to Panama. Two women came from each country of province nine. By the way, province nine <clears throat> is uh, Dominican Republic, um, Puerto Rico, Honduras, Venezuela, Ecuador, and, and Colombia. Um, so we have two women coming from each of those countries. We had one, two, three bishops. Yeah, Bishop Olguin from the Dominican Republic, Bishop Quesada from the Dominican Republic, Bishop Allen from Honduras. They also joined us. I know that they were sitting on the floor. <laughs> yes. <Yeah, so, laughs> yeah, that's pretty <clears throat> We are waiting for a day when we'll have female bishops in province tonight. <laughs> Would it help if I turn? Yeah. Have you seen that for <clears throat> Push it all the way till it clicks. It, it's very loony. Or push the other one too. There you go, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you. So this was awesome. It was a bootcamp on social media. And they invited me and 
Kyle and Jeremy and other folks, and some of the presenters were Latino. One woman who presented, um, I forget her first name, Ferrara was her last name. She came from the Dominican Republic. Um, Ernesto came from El Salvador, which is not really the piece of the church, but it's part of it. You know, did Edgar Edgar presented, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Edgar gave us a lot of uh, support and he was one of the presenters. So I think he talked about Facebook Live. They were all asked us how to do how to do social media uh, with women. And it was really awesome. It was fantastic. Um, this happened last August. Let me give you some practical advice about things that I had experienced. My personal experience has been more than anything else with videos. I'm still learning, and I'm not a professional video editor, but I'm learning, and I think it's super exciting. I think that there's a lot of interest among Latino folks to see a nice video message. Um, so my advice, if you're thinking of doing um, um, videos, is start simple. Try to go beyond the talking head. Um, so what I try to do is I try to find an interesting object or sign or a logo or an interesting background when I make one of my sh very short, short videos. Um, if you are working with a video editor, uh, iMovie comes free of charge with any Mac. And there's an equivalent that comes with, with any Windows computer. Um, Interpolate images. People talk about the Ken Burns effect. Does, does anyone know what that is? Yeah, like okay. where you fade from one picture to the next. Well, yeah, actually, the, the effect itself yes. is that technique when the picture, I think, enlarges mm -hmm. in the center, right. from the center, like like Ken Burns famously did in his Civil War documentary. Um, anyway, but there are many ways in which um, you can inter interpolate images. Uh, in a, you know, what do you write about in your videos? What are you I'm, about? I'm going to show you what it's all okay. about. All right. But I, I do many different things. Some are interviews with other folks, some are personal reflections. I will show you. So if, does anyone know what the B roll is? Yeah. So, this is a traditional term that we use in journalism. Uh, and it is like if you're interviewing a professor, you know, the professor is talking to you. And all of a sudden, instead of seeing the professor anymore talking to the mic, you see the professor working his computer, for example, or walking across campus, right? <laughs> and that is something that on the one hand adds interest, you know, a different scene um, or uh, interest in images, but also is excellent for editing. Yeah. Because if you are cutting, you know, if you're um, giving a summary of what the professor said, you know, you can make a cut and it's an invisible cut, no one can see it. You can put it into it. Um, Keep them short, preferably under three minutes, particularly if they are talking head. Mm -hmm. A talking head video should not be over three minutes. The authenticity of the message is more important than the quality of the production. I think that we can reach people when we talk directly to the camera. If we have a good story, if it's an authentic story, we can move them more than with spending a lot of money to make a professional Invest time in creating transcriptions and or subtitles. This is, by the way, this is a topic that I talked about in, in Panama, uh, transcriptions and subtitles, in which I have some experience. Yeah. I think that the next, yeah. So, well, this will be an example. This is uh, Dia de los Muertos. I was here for the consecration of uh, Bishop Curry or installation of Bishop Curry. And I went to the church where I got married, the building where I got married, which is in uh, St. Stephen and the Incarnation in Columbia Heights, Washington, D.C. And I interviewed Sarah Beth Goodwin, who at the time was the priest, and Irma, who is one of the, of the folks, one of the leaders in the church. And they were doing, um, they had an altar, and they were talking about Dia de los Muertos. I thought, wonderful. So my primary language there was English, because I want, uh, Anglo Episcopalians to learn about the tradition of the Dia de los Muertos. So, as much as possible, I try to use English. And when I talk with Sarah, uh, Sarah, I was speaking English. But Irma only speaks French. So, when she spoke, I used English subtitles. Now, I also want 
the Latino members of the church to know what I do. So if I was speaking in English with Sarah Beth, here the Sacanos were in Spanish and vice versa. So I use I try to use creative. Yeah. Yeah. Want, um, I don't know if you want to address the issue, the difference between translation and adaptation, because there's especially so many terms yeah. that do not do that translate. I think and I, we we run into these miscommunications again and again and again this work where I remember I did a lot of work around foster care. Well, you know, if you did a, just a straight translation of some of these terms, like foster care in particular, it turns out um, to mean something like akin to, like a chicken coop, you know? You so, can translate it girl, like foster care. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure Yeah. Not sure so um, my only, I mean, it is a challenge because we're resource tight, you know, we don't always have the, the capacity to really do that adaptive work around some of these very technical so much the temptation it's expensive to hire a translator right so much the temptation to go to google translate yes please okay. yeah. now Thank you. if you have if you absolutely don't have you have zero money do google translate and then take the text to someone so if possible they yeah they yeah. 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 Now, even better if you know if you went to high school, you know, if you know spelling and things like that, and, that, and tell him, you know, what can you do with this, and give him complete freedom to change, right? Mm -hmm. If you are using Spanish, make sure that it is as good as possible. Please don't miss things like the enye, the, the tilde on the enye, right? Mm -hmm. Don't miss the opening exclamation point or the opening in, uh, question mark of Spanish that are reversed. Okay, those are very, the accents. Sometimes when you do documents, you know, the documents go from one format to the other, and all the all the sudden, all the accents are lost, right? So make sure that your final product is as professional as possible. Well, and there may be too. I don't know if you found this to be the case. Has to be some rec reconciliation when you're dealing with these very large, very diverse. Communities where Spanish is not Spanish, is Spanish is not Spanish, is not Spanish. So if you're Mexican versus if you're coming from Caribbean or you're coming from, you know, uh, Spain. Cal Spain or California. I'll give you an example in a minute. Yeah. The importance of transcriptions. Okay. So in the old days, transcriptions were for deaf people. But there's a whole wide range of reasons why we want to use transcriptions. First of all, noisy environment. You know, when you're making a video, I will give you an example. You know, sometimes it gets very noisy and people have trouble hearing. Second, partial proficiency audience. Mm -hmm. You have you noticed in complaints that all the instructions when they appear in, in the screen, they are, there is a transcription just in English. What happens for people who studied English, particularly people like me who studied English, you know, as young people, it's much easier if we can also read. So it's, it's an important help. And finally, Facebook autoplay feature. Does anyone know what that is? No. Yeah. Here it is. It means that when you're looking at, at your Facebook feed, it, not in your computer, but in your iPhone or your smartphone, and you scroll down, by default, if there's a video, the videos will start to play. Right, that's a, yeah, a more recent feature, right? It's a recent feature. Okay. See how they you scroll up and they start to play immediately. Now, what happens? Very often we are browsing in silence. We cannot hear right, uh, what, what is going on. But now always what you want to do is from the very beginning, the very first microsecond, you want to have a subtitle. Right. Because perhaps a subtitle is what will uh, uh, make the person realize that they want to see that. Because the audio doesn't play till you click right. it. Right. Right. I mean, it's so actually, it actually okay. is oh, silent. Yeah, my default is silent. Default is yeah. silent. It's, not just your, it's yeah. not just your volume. And so you actually have to touch it to right. get the sound. So you're right. If you want the message to come across. So but it seems to me that now yeah. we are in the church. If we have the time, you know, we should be investing in just creating um, um, 
transcriptions and they should be in large characters so that people can read it with the mm -hmm. smartphones. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> These are um, some tips both for translations and transcriptions. When necessary, shorten subtitles, particularly from English to Spanish, right? Because Spanish words tend to be longer. <clears throat> the person has to have enough time to read what you wrote. If you need to, to summarize, if you need to uh, reduce the, the, the amount of words and so forth, try to get the gist, but don't, don't be afraid. In fact, you shouldn't be writing things that people do not have time to read. And if necessary, clarify the meaning. And the example that I'm going to give relates to um, what we were just talking about. Does anyone know how to say kite in Spanish? No? Yeah. Argentina, oh, okay. Barrilla, Chile, Volantín, Paraguay, Pandora, Mexico, Papalote, Dominican Republic, Chichiwa, Spain, Cometa. There's at least six words that I know for kite, all right? I would never try to talk about a kite. Yeah. <laughs> well, that thing. so what you try to do is you try to find the most universal, the most standard word. In this case, if I have, you know, if I am, my audience is a population from any country, I would use cometa. Because How do you know that? Yeah. Well, this is the word, it comes from Spain and it's used in Latin America. That's good enough. Uh, is that if you go to the dictionary, it's the first word that will appear. Um, yeah. So is it always the comment? case that in the dictionary the first one appears is the most used? No, I don't think so. It's pretty tricky. Yeah. And particularly the words that mean more than one thing, right? That's why you need a translator. You yeah. Well, even in the, even among the translators. That what happens is that when you're doing this work, you get serious about doing this work and serving this community well, you have to be willing to reconcile. You have to be willing to put together the style of guide and, and to check and cross-check. I mean, it, it's quite, to do it right, it's quite a bit of work. It's intentional. I think that we've talked a lot about intentionality. Right. I just want to say I have much less experience with this than you do, but I've been very grateful for um, when when I or we in the ministry area have tried to translate and tried to meet those standards and missed. You know, when we've got, I've been really grateful that many people are both compassionate. <laughs> there, were, you know, some of the readers are more grateful that we tried. Mm -hmm. Than judgmental that we got it wrong, yeah. right? I mean, I'm sure there's some exceptions, but but when I'm an, obviously an Anglo woman trying, I've experienced almost universally kindness about my effort and laughter. I mean, they laugh at me, you know, when I said I was pregnant, but I didn't, I didn't make sure I was embarrassed. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, all that good stuff. But but, but I think um, for especially for someone my age and older, you know, where we, we were taught to get things right before we risk. You know, mm -hmm. that whole thing about Rather, real, rather than fail to try, you try to. Um, I'm grateful that in my you know, exposure to my Latino community friends, they've been mostly very kind about my attempts. Wonderful. Yes, my, my experience um, speaking English or trying to speak French has been right. the same. Um, and it's very good to laugh at yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is an example. One and a half year ago, I think it was the last information. Do you recognize this background? It's the chapel. Yeah. Oh. The chapel here at the background. Yeah. So we were done for, for the information event in June, one and a half year ago. And I was waiting for my friend um, Larry to pick me up. He was going to take me for lunch. And I decided to walk there and I got the idea for the video. So I will show you the video, and I would like you to pay attention, and then I hopefully you will critique and criticize it. I hope you will. Uh, I don't know the sound. Is this a selfie video? Hmm? Did you do this yourself, like holding that? Do you want to show uh, it through the system in the room? Um, um, if I turn up my oh, volume, oh, that's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So we'll hear it. Okay. 
no, my friend Larry, Larry he when he came out of the car, I asked him, hey Larry, and I gave him a couple of pointers uh, how he wanted to do it. Okay. He thinks we're going to get feedback, but let's continue. Give it a shot. Oh, wait. We don't really need my Spanish <laughs> because I decided to do it in Spanish with English subtitles. Mm -hmm. So there's a new subtitle. Actually, we don't need this. Okay. <clears throat> oh. And yet, we will leave the sound for the next one. <laughs> Is there a way we can get sound uh, yeah, without me, echoing? Uh, let me join. Yeah. Han oído decir que que ven detrás mío son las ruinas de la iglesia en el seminario teológico de Virginia. Hace algunos años, por accidente, el edificio se incendió. Las autoridades del seminario, en lugar de reconstruir la vieja iglesia, decidieron construir un edificio nuevo. Un edificio más grande que se adapta a las necesidades de la congregación. Un edificio con cámaras de web y acceso al internet, de manera que pueden transmitir la misa a todo el mundo. Quiero que pensemos en eso, como una reflexión de la iglesia que estamos construyendo. No es una iglesia que se olvida de la iglesia tradicional, sino que sobre sus, los fundamentos de la iglesia vieja construye una iglesia nueva, una iglesia donde todos son invitados a seguir a Jesús. So, what do you think? <laughs> It's just how I love the story you told about how spontaneously this came to you, mm -hmm. and you just did it. You know, obviously you didn't end it, but, but I'm just like the inspiration was the context. But you know your audience, and you know your message, and the parts that you put yourself in. From the technical point of view, I'm very disappointed with what I did. <laughs> Can you guys think? But it was what? spontaneous. Well, yeah. But it's spontaneous, but in keeping with what you're saying before, if you integrated a piece of the actual room uh -huh. behind you, mm -hmm. so that you're talking about it, so we would see your face, but then also integrate other, other pieces, so you actually see it, and then coming back to you with that in the background, so it's building up. Also, the important visual, this is not meant to be offensive, the most important visual is the church. Yes, that's right. right. Yeah, yeah, and that's you got right. that. Yeah, well. that's very cool. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Obviously, because of the shade and the, and the contrast yeah. with the very lit background, um, I am really dark. I don't know, perhaps I could have placed the camera in a better place, but uh, you know, in the spur of the moment, uh, without you really knowing much. Lights. You would have needed lights and reflectors. Mm. And Maybe if I was standing there with a lot of light, I could have shown both the ruins. I don't know. I, but you know what, the, having not the light on you, but behind actually kind of works mm -hmm. in a way. Unintentionally, yes, right.
I actually see them. What's interesting is that um, the audience is out there is so much more accustomed to the like, production we use to talk kind of what we've done. You know, right. they're accepting of it because everybody's making videos on their phones and mm -hmm. editing on their phones and doing all and so they, they, so they, they you don't need a huge amount of production value to keep the audience mm -hmm. as much or more about the message. Well, and it's also what I enjoyed about it also was the, was the authenticity yeah. of the piece. Mm -hmm. You know, he <clears throat> met, met at the odds, at the and we were speaking, we're to, speaking to not everybody, not everybody, everybody just respected to that one that one The audio quality was good, though. Yeah, that's what's so important. I think I think iPhone. Um, by the way, the images look choppy just because of the Wi-Fi here. Right, yes. um, the, the next one that I'm going to show you, I am going to also show it, show it to you in the screen in case the image is, is choppy. Maybe you want to get a little closer. Um, anyway, what, anything else? Well, my primary audience was Spanish-speaking Latino episcopalians. That was my primary target audience for this video. But I want the Anglos to know what's going on. We have Anglos who follow me on Facebook and other on YouTube. And I want my boss who doesn't speak uh, Spanish to know what I'm doing, yes. right? So for all those reasons, I have the subtitles in, mm -hmm. um, in uh, English. Eventually, I think what's gonna happen, the more we use Facebook, or at least to the extent that we have resources to put places on Facebook, I think that we should be moving more toward, for instance, like me, I'm bilingual. For instance, like me, I'm bilingual. If I do it in English, English, it, in English, 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 English it should be English subtitles, English transcription. English transcription. And, and if I'm doing it in Spanish, 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 Spanish transcription, so that when people are um, browsing and scrolling down, the autoplay function will help them decide if they want to. Turn on the sound. But I realize that we have limitations. But I realize that we have limitations. You know. If you are, by the way, if you are planning to to put um, this is something that I learned. If you are planning to upload a video to Facebook, upload it to Facebook. Don't upload it to YouTube and create a link. I know uh, about this because I had an experience. There was this awesome video. I thought I was having. I'm going to have hundreds of likes. No one took a look. At least, in, well, yeah, I think on every screen, if it's a link from YouTube, the image appears very tiny. Mm -hmm. I think also there might be things that they are doing behind the scenes with the, mm -hmm. with, you know, the yeah, ranking where, the, yeah. where it appears. Mm -hmm. But if it is a YouTube, uh, um, a Facebook uh, video that it was up, uploaded on Facebook, the image will appear bigger and probably have a better chance. This is not completely on the track, but I have a question for you is that you're uploading on Facebook and you have a video production, but my, as far as the age group that you're hitting mm -hmm. with Facebook is older than the, the do, I'm thinking of the 18 through 25. They're not, are they still on Facebook? I mean, my son, I mean, I have two boys and Facebook is more yeah. for older. <laughs> Yeah, I think it was four years ago or six years ago that Anthony Guillen told us that precisely because their parents and grandparents were on Facebook, the youth was yeah. fleeing right. and, and going to it. I, that, I think six Instagram. years ago they were going back to MySpace. Right. Yeah. I don't know now they might be. Yeah, happy. Instagram is sort of a big space. It, it's funny, what, what they saw was a precipitous decline of young people and then it's flat. Right. And most young people have a Facebook. Profile and they check it now and then. I mean, they're, they're on, <laughs> but a lot of them use Facebook Messenger. Okay. So, um, it, you know, it's, it just depends. But, but I think, yeah. Right. I have uh, in Argentina. I have my nephew. Uh, one is um, 16, 17, and he posts sometimes on Facebook, and sometimes it's his friends who post the pictures. Right. And so for someone like me, it's great, you know. Right. I can see him, but I don't think he does not use it every day. Yeah. yeah. You're open captioning anyway, Yes, I was going to talk about op uh, open. Did I mention anything about open yeah, caption versus closed caption? Yeah. Do you guys know the difference between the two? Open. Uh, um, so, open captions means that 
the text of this transcription or subtitle is, as they say, burnt into the image. It's like the, in the old days when you, you went to the movies and if you wanted subtitles, the actual image had to be created on the film with the, the text, okay? Closed captioning means that it is a separate file. Okay. okay, and it has advantages and disadvantages. It has advantages with, and disadvantages. Um, with um, with um, open, open captioning, captioning is very, very easy, easy to have multiple languages. languages. On YouTube, it's very easy. You can type, and, and you can type more than one language. And the user, if you go to the click on CC on YouTube, you can choose the language. But I, there's also the disadvantage. For me, the main disadvantage is that people don't know. That the, you know, by default, they have not turned on their CC feature. So there are subtitles or there are the transcription and they don't even know. So I prefer open captions that are burned into the. Because, so what I do is I don't upload this to Facebook. I use a video editor, which is a very, in a very humble way with, with iMovie or I forget the name of the videos. There, these are free of charge, they come with your, with your this is software. And you can do very fancy things. I'm going to show you an example now. And I'm sure this guy was using probably my movie, something very standard, very... And I'm going to turn this so that in case the image is choppy. And I'm going to turn on the sound here. Is that okay, Nick? The conversation about undocumented immigrants always gets people going, even amongst Latinos. However, it's an important part of so many of our stories, including my own. In the late 70s and throughout the 80s, my family fled El Salvador undocumented because of poverty and the Civil War. People act like immigrants want to leave their educations, their homes, their families, and everything they know just because they want to. Immigrants leave their homes out of necessity, out of the need for a better life. After all, we were all immigrants once. This is my Ulipa Gladys' story, the matriarch of our family, and I'm so proud and I wouldn't have it any other way. What's up guys, my name is Curly and this is my grandmother Gladys. Say hi. Hello, oh, hi. how are you? Today we're gonna talk about where you're from. We're gonna talk about when you came here. You came here to the United States right before the Civil War. How old were you when you came? 29. Pero mi papá vino durante la guerra. Ajá. ¿Y sé De mi tía. ¿Te acuerdas de tía Alicia? Sí. Ah, pues yo le dije un día, oye, yo voy a ir a Los Ángeles. ¿Quieres que me paguen? De verdad me dijo, ok. Tal día, tales horas, después te desayuno, nos vamos para Los Ángeles. Ajá. We're coming with the finger. Like you hitchhike. This is hitchhike. Uh, en inglés, esto se dice hitchhike. 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 No, I don't know how to say it. From <laughs> Santa Tecla to La Frontera de Guatemala. ¿Cómo de llegaste San... ahí? En un bus que se llamaba La Melba. Cobraban cinco pesos. Para llevarte a El Salvador hasta la frontera de Guatemala. Hasta la frontera. Ahí estuvimos paradas casi toda la medianoche, esperando que nos dejaran pasar. Yo no tenía vez. Así mojada de principio. ¿Dónde dormiste? Ahí, sentada, sentada esperando el bus. You hitchhike where? Ahí a la frontera de México. Hay mucha gente bonita en México que te ayuda. Le digo, ¿para dónde vas? Para México, sí. Uh -huh. Ah, pero nosotros vamos a Puebla nada más. Ah, pues ahí no te ¿Y te dejaron pasar ahí o tenías que pagar? No, ahí de escondidito. ¿Y de Oaxaca fueron a México City? ¿Y de no, a Puebla. ¿Y de Puebla dónde fueron? En Mexico City. Ajá. Y después de dónde? Llegamos a Tijuana. Cuando tú y mi tía Alicia llegaron la, a la frontera de México y los Estados Unidos, ¿qué estaban pensando ustedes? Que teníamos miedo. Pensando cómo íbamos a hacer. ¿Cómo pasaron? Corriendo, pum. Te levantas y pum, otra vez te vuelves a caer. Y la pobrecita, cuando se cayó, uh -huh. puso la mano en una plástica acá. O oh, lo aplastó. Y cuando ustedes cruzaron, ¿nadie los vio? ¿Cómo no? La migración, ellas dicen, la meca, pum, se cuesta, en el piso, no se muevan, no se apoyan. Y ya nos agarran, ¿para dónde van? Para otro lado. 
ellos mismos te aceptan como antes, hace más de 50 años. Uh -huh. Era poquita gente la que pasaba. Así. ¿Y qué tanto duró ese viaje? Como un mes. ¿Un mes? ¿Qué es la razón que tú te querías ir de El Salvador Salvador. para venirte aquí? Ya no había dinero. Tu abuela no tenía trabajo. Pero eso es una gran decisión para mí. Irte de tu casa a casi 30 años para empezar de nuevo en otro país. ¿Y sin tener a quién? Sin tener dinero, sin saber a nadie. ¿De dónde sacaste ese poder para hacer todo eso? La miseria. ¿Y pero lo extrañas a veces? No, pues tu país nunca lo puedes olvidar. El Salvador es muy lindo. Tiene lugares bien preciosos que visitar el Puerto de la Libertad. Los chorros que está camino para Santana o para Sonsonate. Yo me recuerdo cuando me llevaron los chorros. Me recuerdo los pescados. Están pescaditos así que andan adentro. Hay que es una piscinota grandota, grandota. Ay, I love you. Mm, thank you for coming to hang out. Yeah. That's it. Ah, como me dijiste que me iba a sacar en la TV. Ay, Ay, venga, tú me arrancas, te voy a arrancar los tuyos. Obviously, well. Obviously, this is. Uh, targeting, obviously, uh, Anglo audiences mostly. Everything has uh, English subtitles. Um, and obviously, this is not for a discotheque. But I was so, no, this is only for a discotheque. I was so moved by this mm -hmm. short story. How much money do you think this guy spent to make this? None. None. I, yeah, probably none. I mean, the all the the production values and the movie editing, any teenager Dang. can learn in a weekend how to do this. Any any of us can learn in a weekend how to like, edit videos mm -hmm. like this. And and all the help that you had with with, with, with the wording. By the way, the sandals were great. It was a little bit choppy on this big screen, but in this screen you see perfectly, you were perfectly uh, synchronized with what we were saying. You could follow them. And how he differentiated on the screen that he was talking. She was talking to okay. make it obvious. You know. So intelligent use of colors there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, those uh, those images uh, that would appear with inspiration who was who. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, such a moving story, right? And with humor. So there you have a young, I don't know if it's generation Y, a young Latino guy, millennial perhaps. I think he, I saw a lot of bling in what he was wearing. I think he might be queer, he might be gay. I don't know. Doesn't matter. He was very likable. Yeah. Yes, he was, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so all the stereotypes that you have about the Latino men crumbling there too. And, and I, I think, think it sounds love and appreciation. Yeah, that's, that's what did it. Right. For her. Mm -hmm. Sincerely. Mm -hmm. So if you want to find it on YouTube, type Abuelita Story and it will appear. I'm almost done. Uh, we still have time, right? Yeah, no, no, we got your time for Q and A. Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> one more time. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet, if you say so, I will let down the nets. This is um, this is Anthony Guillen, the missioner for the whole Church for Latino Ministry. And this is his council of advice. We met uh, this week, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we met in California. And uh, I have been in his council of advice for three years now. Every two years, we have an event. It's the largest event of Latino ministers in the church. It's called Nuevo Amanecer, which literally means new dawn. It's a Nuevo Amanecer conference. And we hold it in Canuga at the Episcopal Retreat Center there. So in North Carolina. And two years ago, before, it's always at the end of August, but a little bit earlier, several months before, I came up with an idea. And I, I'm telling you again, by the way, he's a big, big, uh, he's really big in, in, in social networks and uh, digital media uh, initiatives. Um, and 
I came up with the idea that we had to create an award. And I, I thought that it would be awesome to call it HLS Revis uh, or Casta Networks. Uh, I should say networks. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a word that we also use Casta Networks. And I he thought it was an awesome idea. But when I suggested the award, I already had someone in mind. You should see the award. That's the truth. I never told him. <laughs> <laughs> The Reverend Vidal Rivas from Hyattsville, up here in Maryland. I'm going to see him on Monday. By the way, he's from El Salvador. I'm going to interview him, very short interview on Monday, and I'm going to ask him. I think that 40% of his confirmation are Salvadorians and feel threatened by the new White House vote. Just mm -hmm. sign up. Uh, and then Bishop. Uh, uh, Marian Bali and, and other bishops are making statements mm -hmm. about the liberation crisis, that, or the, yeah, the deportation crisis that we are creating or are about to create. Um, really, very neat guy. So he came, I think, it was the first, at least the first information that I came to, like maybe five years ago, or I don't know, four years ago. And he, he came and he brought. Um, a team of lay members from his church to this event. At that time, the first two informations in the evening, there were sessions all in Spanish. So local folks after work could, could join us and we were broadcasting and they those sessions. It was awesome. The local Latino folks of several dioceses in there was awesome. As a result of what they learned at that time, one of the lay members created something called Radio San Mateo. And now he is giving this very short sermon. They are broadcasting live their Eucharistic services, and almost every day you will find gospel and reflection for this case in the last Thursday. So almost every day he's posting those. They are awesome. I, they started with, I think, with a podcast, with just sound. It was really a radio. It was called Radio San Mateo. It was really a the sound thing, but eventually, very quickly, they, they turn into this. It is, I thought it was so awesome, so awesome. And one of the things that impressed me the most is that he, his leadership skills, he didn't say, I have to learn how to use it. He let the team of lay leaders do it. All he does is, uh, he's a pastor, he's a pastor at the church. And so I wanted him to receive the award. Um, all, all the ones who were consulted, I think, agreed, and Anthony agreed. And um, two years ago, uh, in August, we gave him, so gave him the first Cast the Nets Award ah. in Kanuga, and here he is with his team of members. <clears throat> Can we say this prayer all together? God, God, Father, and Mother, Mother, who told the disciples to turn to us in the net, lead us by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, to cast our nets to the right place, at the right time, with authenticity and with passion, so that we too may become fishers of people. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you. Thank you. And I would love to. You know, comments or questions. We have more than 15 minutes. Is that right? So, or do, do we finish at three? Or three. Three. three? three. Oh, we minutes. have. There's yeah. a little gathering downstairs or in the one away. Right. The closing. Okay. So, meditation. Yeah. Say yeah. something. I need to take a break, but okay. I loved your presentation. <laughs> if anyone wants to ask me anything else about. Uh, the Latino ministry, or what I do with the Latino ministry, or some of the products that I'm working on preparing, I do that. Uh, if you want to finish now, we'll go get a cup of coffee or go to the bathroom, we can finish now. Well, we, um, you know, we have a, our school community is largely international. So at this point in time, school is 30% international. There's a large group of uh, Spanish-speaking girls from all over. This year, at this time in particular, we felt like we should get the word out more that Spanish-speaking um,
speaking with students are welcome at our community. Make sure that they know that it's a welcoming, inclusive community that's really tied very firmly to those really important Episcopal tenants. And so we've, we've been, uh, I, don't, I don't want to say advertising more, but actively marketing more to not just leave it to chance that, you know, the Latinas are going to find one, find us, find us among many other schools, but also know that our school is, um, has a long tradition of being a community where they're, you know, they're welcome. And it's been, it's been really fun because um, we, we're on this portal now that is in 11 countries in Spanish and English. Um, so, um, Do you have a video presentation that they will see when they first go to your website? We're just, um, we do, yeah, but we don't have content in Spanish. On the website. Do you yeah, have an English transcription? No, well, not no. yet, but this okay. is something that I'm working on now. That would be, I think, the first step, perhaps, for you would be just English transcriptions. Right. If, if I assume these are international students whose families might be wealthy, all across the board, because we're a church school. Um, our mission is to certainly support. Do they come from foreign countries? They come from as we've had as representative as many as seventeen foreign countries. So, you know, if. The wealthier they are, no matter what country from, the more likely that they would be able to read. Yeah. Not to speak. Mm -hmm. So I will start with, with English language. The content on the portals in English, Spanish, and English. Ah, you really have yeah. multiple languages. But what's fun now is I'm using their social media channels, not just relying on our social media channels, but using this portal's social media channels to help get the word out in multiple languages. Yeah. So we'll see what we'll see what happens. We'll see if we reach anybody. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. I have a social question. Are you staying here today? Yeah. So if anyone's still on campus tonight, it's probably Oliver's birthday, which we have to Yes. So some of us are going to be in eight to twenty three at nine o'clock. So if you're back from whatever or around or awake, um, eighteen twenty three is the little bar cafe. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right, at nine o'clock. Um, just and the reason it's that is I personally have to go off campus to do something for you.